Hello everybody, welcome back to my YouTube channel. This is going to be the sixth and final installment of our methamphetamine substance use disorder series. We will be concluding with this lovely little algorithm that I have made. Um, if you do want a copy of this, please just send me an email. There's going to be my email address in my YouTube channel because I know that my little bubble here has kind of cut off um, the serotonin toxicity part. Um, but please, it is copyrighted. Um, I will give it to you for free. I am willing to share this. So this um, algorithm is based on a stoplight thing. You have a couple of decision trees. Does your patient test positive for amphetamines in the urine or blood? Um, is the patient acutely intoxicated? Yes. Can their surgery be delayed? Um, it is best to delay these patients until um, they no longer test positive. And I know that this is kind of tough and I think that we've talked about this in some of our prior videos um, but some patients depending on how much they use can test positive for even up until 10 days. Now some um, people have said that if um, they are not exhibiting any symptoms anymore of being intoxicated that they could probably proceed with surgery and um, that might be true but in our litigious society it's usually best to delay until you have a negative test. Um, now, another thing that I would like to say is that I did a lot of searching, a lot of soul searching for that perfect test, right? Um, so if somebody's intoxicated, um, they have a blood alcohol content, and usually that blood alcohol content reflects how intoxicated they are. No such thing exists that I have found for methamphetamines at this time. If I'm wrong, please reach out to me. I am dying to know this information. I have called many different laboratories to see um, what, if anything, there is. Maybe we'll find this in the future. I'm not sure. Um, so if your patient is a known methamphetamine user but has um, a negative screening and it's safe to proceed, what I'm saying here is that let's say you have somebody who is a user. They've had stained. Um, they are not um, positive. Um, for amphetamines or methamphetamines, I would go ahead and proceed with their surgery. You shouldn't expect any hemodynamic instability if their test is negative, even though they, they do have a history of use. Um, so let's go back to the other part of that. Let's say, um, is the surgery urgent emergent? If not, postpone. If it is, um, then you can proceed. And the things that you want to be... Um, Cognizant of, like I said in my other videos, do not restrain the patient. Um, these people can go into cardiovascular collapse uh, against a struggle. Avoid all beta blockers. And I'm going to put a little kind of pin in your ear here because I'm going to follow up with another video um, for some updates about this lecture series. Uh, avoid succinylcholine. That's just a risk of rhabdo. And you can still give rocuronium. You can reverse with sugamidex if you needed to. Um, give benzodiazepines. This is really going to be your first and primary uh, treatment and they say that you can give uh, two milligrams every eight to ten minutes and some people might even require up to 20 milligrams of benzodiazepines. If benzodiazepines aren't working anymore, by the way my cat Sammy says hi, um, if benzodiazepines aren't working anymore of course you can give Haldol and there's a little note at the bottom of the algorithm for that as well which we'll get into. Um, if you do have to so, um, support their blood pressure you're going to want to use um, epinephrine or phenylephrine. Yes, Samuel. Uh, <laughs> if they do have um, uh, some blood pressure issues, you can use calcium channel blockers. Um, but kind of keep in mind that on the back end of this, they might have some tachycardia. Um, and you can also use nitro or nipride to bring their blood pressure down as well. Um, Again, rhabdo, avoid succinylcholine. If they do go into rhabdo, give IV fluids and supportive therapy. So make sure that you're um, setting your ventilator settings as appropriate. If they have serotonin toxicity, the great news is here that you would treat them with benzodiazepines, just like we treat um, methamphetamine substance use disorder patients with benzodiazepines first. Um, you can also give the medications listed there and you can control the blood pressure with nipride. You want to avoid um, meparidine, tramadol, methylene blue. And then it says opioids, and I know that we talked about this before. That's a little tricky because, of course, we use fentanyl and opioids in surgery. 
um, basically kind of just do the best that you can. Use with caution, and again, I know you can't see this because my little bubble is here, but um, use caution with Zofran, and I think that's still kind of a bunch of um, in incorrect information to give you. Um, you know, we um, we use um, Ondansetran, Zofran as a treatment um, for um, people with suspected. Um, <laughs> uh, amniotic fluid embolus. Uh, so that's kind of the same premise there. Uh, so what if you have a pregnant patient who uh, tests positive for amphetamines? Is a surgery urgent or emergent? Um, if it's not, please postpone. Um, you can use norexial anesthesia. Uh, I think many providers would recommend against it because the hypotension is just going to be so profound, right? We get hypotension with patients who aren't methamphetamine substance use disorders. Um, if they're actively intoxicated, then you might also be concerned that um, they're not going to sit still for the norexial anesthesia. But um, I kind of wanted to put this part in here to let you know that if you have somebody who is um, a substance user that is not going to say that she can't get an epidural for her labor. If she comes in, she says, hey, I'm a user. Um, and let's say she's uh, not positive, or maybe she is positive, but she's like, I abstained for the last three days or whatever. If if she could sit still and you wanted to give her an epidural, um, you know, watch the blood pressure, make sure that she doesn't tank. But I think that would be completely within the realm of acceptability, especially given what the literature says. Um, if you do have to proceed with anesthesia for um, so a pregnant patient, Please proceed with the anesthesia cautions as followed by the arrow. Um, and then benzodiazepines are still um, the preferred for aggressive patients. I know we kind of talked about this in the other video, but um, there's not a lot of guidance here. Uh, some of the things said you can give benzodiazepines to a pregnant patient, but the mig per kg that it told it out to is two milligrams, which is kind of like, okay, well, two milligrams isn't necessarily going to do anything for a patient who's aggressive on methamphetamines. Um, in that case, I think it would be appropriate to give Haldol. And then of course you kind of have to worry about floppy baby syndrome, that the benzodiazepines are going to get into the baby. Um, but also the methamphetamines got to the baby. So are we having a methamphetamine intoxicated uh, baby once delivery has occurred? All things to think about. Um, the other little bit at the end is that um, benzodiazepines are pregnancy category D, whereas Haldol are pregnancy category C. So um, that might kind of behoove you to make a decision if you were concerned, especially if it was a first trimester patient and you really wanted to avoid that risk of benzodiazepines, that would be completely um, responsible to give Haldol. And that is the end of the lecture. Again, please see um, this YouTube channel for one more um, little video that I wanted to make about some updates that I've learned since I started doing these videos. Um, there has actually been new information out. My apologies, everything's always changing. And the bits at the back, all my millions of pages of references. Oh, so many references. So important though. Thank you everybody and I hope to see you next time. Bye.